Good afternoon. I'm Jim Duff, the Executive Director of the Supreme Court Historical Society and delighted to be with you this afternoon. It's my honor to welcome you to the Society's virtual lecture platform today. While the Supreme Court building remains closed to the public, the Society has pivoted to a series of lectures and discussions over Zoom. We're delighted you've joined us in that capacity today. We look forward to a return to in-person uh, programming when we're able to do so, when the court reopens to the public. But we also plan to continue these virtual lectures as well. It's been a, a great uh, bright light uh, during the pandemic to be able to connect to our uh, uh, members uh, through these programs who might not otherwise travel to Washington, D.C. to join us. So uh, it's a uh, one of the uh, benefits, I think, that came out of the pandemic is that uh, we learned a lot and we're going to continue uh, programs in this uh, forum. Today's program is a conversation with Professors Martha Jones and David Gelman on the Jay family, slavery, abolition, and an enslaved woman named Abigail. Uh, I will abbreviate the introductions uh, that they both deserve uh, in order to allot as much time as possible for their conversations, which I think you'll find fascinating today. Professor Martha Jones is a Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor, uh, Professor of History, and a professor at the SNF Agora Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, she is a legal and cultural historian whose work examines how Black Americans have shaped the story of American democracy. She is the author of Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All in 2020, Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America in 2018. She was a winner of the Organization of American Historians Liberty Legacy Award. <clears throat> And uh, she uh, was the American Historical Society Association Littleton Griswold Prize, the American Society for Legal History and John Philip Reed Book Award, and a Baltimore City Historical Society Scholars Honor for 2020. Professor Jones holds a PhD in history from Columbia University and a Juris Doctorate degree from SUNY School of Law. David Gelman is professor of history at DePaul University. He is an early American historian with particular focus on efforts to abolish slavery from the age of revolution through the Civil War and on colonial North American <coughs> society. He is the author of Liberty's Chain, Slavery, Abolition, and the Jay Family of New York, which was published in spring this year. He co-authored the textbook, American Odysseys, A History of Colonial North America. And uh, he holds a PhD from Northwestern University. The professors will be, uh, begin with brief statements on their work on the Jay family, and then we'll engage in conversation on their work and findings. We will take questions from the audience near the end. So please submit your questions in the Q&A window of Zoom and we will get to as many of those as you can. I'm going to get out of the way and let these wonderful professors uh, converse and the floor is now yours. I don't think we decided who was gonna speak first. <laughs> so David, I don't know what you think, but I'm happy to be here with you in any case. Uh, yes, me too. Um, but by all means, if you want to go first, that's great. Okay. Well, um, well, thank you. Um, and it really is um, an honor to be with you. Um, it's so exciting to me that um, unbeknownst to either of us, we were thinking um, about some of the same material, um, some of the same historical figures. And um, I'm so grateful to the Supreme Court Historical Society for um, hosting us um, and uh, giving us a chance to talk together. Um, I'm here today to introduce an essay uh, that I published uh, last spring 
um, in a collaboration between uh, the New York Times travel section um, and its narrative projects, um, an essay about a woman um, whom we know um, by one name, um, Abigail. Um, as I say in the piece, um, Abigail is someone I had been, um, whose trail I had been following um, for a long time um, when the chance to write about her came up. Um, I knew that she had been enslaved by the Jay family in New York. She had followed the family to Europe um, and that she died in Paris after attempting to leave the Jay household. Um, Mrs. Jay um, had had Abigail detained in a local jail, uh, La Petite Force, where um, Abigail took ill. Um, she was released to the Jay household, but never regained her health and perished there in Paris. Um, for some Americans, of course, um, this was an especially auspicious moment in Paris. Jay was among those who had come to the city um, ultimately to sign the Treaty of Paris. Um, it was a moment that marked new autonomy, new freedom, new independence for the United States, um, the cessation um, the of the revolutionary conflict. Um, it's a story that's been told um, in many, in some sense, many, many times, of course. Um, but I return to the story um, to help readers, um, or at least offer readers the opportunity to see that moment from Abigail's point of view, um, held enslaved, adjacent to figures who embodied the nation's ideals, um, but dead after an attempt to gain um, her own modest liberty. For Abigail, there was no promise of the revolution that would be fulfilled. There were no ideals that would be um, struggled toward. There would not even be a long road to slavery's abolition, be it in New York or um, in the nation as a whole. Um, for Abigail, the story of the revolution ends in Paris in 1783. My research included digging really for any shard that might give us more insight into Abigail, her experience, or how she felt. Um, I found tellings about her in the Jay family papers, Benjamin Franklin's papers, the correspondence from Paris's head of police in those years. People wrote about her. Um, I suspect they talked about her as well. Uh, we get a sense of that. But when I searched in official records for any sign of her time in Paris, um, nothing uh, surfaced. In that absence, uh, my questions really turned to ones about memory, uh, questions about why some are remembered and memorialized, some figures are visible on the public landscape and others are not. Um, I asked, in particular, why Paris, um, a city where I live some of the time, is a city that remembers quite emphatically um, American founders, including Jay. Um, it is a city that uh, quite passionately remembers Black Americans like James Baldwin and Josephine Baker. Um, and it is, it is a city that even pays homage uh, to the enslaved people of the French Empire. Um, those are people who today are credited um, by the state as um, having through their own struggles um, defined France's ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Um, so my question in the end was why no monument to Abigail? Um, uh, and that's perhaps um, simply a rhetorical question for purposes of discussion, but um, Paris did offer um, one um, inadvertent um, response to that. Um, this past spring um, was unveiled um, a monument to a woman known as uh, Solitude, a Guadalupian figure um, who um, is important um, in France's memory of the struggle against um, Napoleon's re-imposition of slavery um, in the wake of the Haitian Revolution. Um, for me, um, a memorial meant um, walking, um, retracing Abigail's steps um, as best I could, along with um, photographer Cédrine Sedig, 
um, for those of you um, who um, can click on to the New York Times piece, you'll find her photographs there. Um, I think they are stunning, um, but mostly um, for the absence that they document, um, they are haunting in the sense that they um, capture um, the um, places that Abigail uh, spent time, um, even as there is um, no express um, memorial um, to her. So maybe with that, I'll I'll pause and um, and just say thank you again. Um, I very much look forward to the conversation with Dr. Gelman. Got a few images to put up. Well, good afternoon, and um, thank you uh, to Jennifer Lowe for organizing this wonderful event, and to Jim Duff for the warm introduction, and to Martha Jones for sharing the honor of this exciting occasion. So I just want to uh, give an overview, sort of idiosyncratic overview of my project, um, into which Abigail's story uh, fits uh, very well and importantly. So. Um, on August 18, 1912, almost exactly 110 years ago, John J. Chapman reflected on the first anniversary of the brutal lynching of a man named Zachariah Walker in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. This direct descendant of founding father John Jay put this brutal act in a much larger historical frame. Quote, this great wickedness is the wickedness of all America and of 300 years, the wickedness of the slave trade. His statement, quote, a nation cannot practice a course of inhuman crime for 300 years and then suddenly throw off its effects was an accusation, not an excuse. This Jay descendant frame Walker's death at the hands of a sadistic mob of ordinary citizens as an exploration of our national story. Given John J. Chapman's name and his lineage, it was a family story as well. My book, Liberty's Chain, by taking up the subject of the Jays in slavery, at once seeks to tell a family story that is because of the Jays special prominence and their singular self-consciousness, also a national story. The main arc of my narrative is not 300 years, but a century from the revolution through reconstruction arguably the most consequential period in U.S. history and certainly in the, in the history of United States slavery. The central, one of the central figures is John Jay, with whom most of this audience is quite familiar as our inaugural Chief Justice, author of some of the Federalist Papers, and a principal figure in the early foreign policy of the United States. Many of you are perhaps less familiar with his role as the enslaver of men, women, and children, and paradoxically, as the inaugural president of one of the world's first anti-slavery societies, the New York Manumission Society, and governor of New York when that state passed its landmark gradual emancipation law in 1799. In my book, John Jay is only a starting point. Embedded in his life and story are people such as Abigail, about whom Martha Jones just spoke so movingly, along with people like Pete, Caesar Valentine, Dinah, Clorinda, Zilpah Montgomery, and other black men and women. We cannot understand the prospect and the pain of the revolutionary era's halting but historically important Northern abolition without their stories. And I look forward to sharing some of these stories um, during the discussion in the Q&A. You are also likely less familiar with John Jay's remarkable and powerfully influential progeny. His sons, Peter Augustus Jay and William Jay and his grandson and namesake, John Jay II. The father and son duo of William and John Jay II in particular offer a glimpse into the transfer and the transformation of values in a prominent and often quite conservative family. The family's identity was tightly bound to the nation's founding, yet William and John II embraced a cause most likely to tear the nation apart by embracing the campaign for the immediate emancipation of millions of enslaved people throughout the continent. As part and parcel of that embrace of radical abolitionism, these two Jays increasingly embraced the twin cause of racial equality in the North. For their commitment to justice, detractors regarded these Jays as fanatics. Their elite peers sometimes scorned them and sometimes puzzled over them. Critics wondered 
How could the descendants of the moderate, temperate John Jay, who was a gradualist in his personal and his political approach to black freedom, take such an extreme position? These Jays were largely defiant in the face of popular and elite scorn. John Jay II was the leading pro bono lawyer in Manhattan in fugitive slave cases. During a hearing in one fugitive case, a party representing a slaveholder punched John Jay II in the nose because he did not like Jay's line of questioning. An aging William Jay, himself a former judge in Westchester County, supported his son and the Underground Railroad. William Jay's 1858 last will and testament defiantly left $1,000 to support his son's ongoing efforts on behalf of fugitives, a, a provision that got noticed and denounced as far away as New Orleans. This act, however, struck the renowned abolitionist Frederick Douglass as the profound parting gesture in a laudable life in the movement. Douglass delivered a public eulogy in which he proclaimed of John Jay's second son, William, in the great cause of universal freedom, his name was a tower of strength and his pen, a two-edged sword. I want to stress that these latter days did not extend and transform the founder of John Jay's more cautious anti-slavery by forgetting the slaveholding past, their families, or their regions. The last two people claimed by John Jay as property, the mother and daughter Clorinda and Zilpa, remained closely tied to the Jays. Clorinda died as a free woman and servant in William Jay's household in 1837. Zilpa Montgomery, her daughter, long remained in the Jay orbit and upon her death in 1872 received burial in the Jay family plot where she remains to this day. The Jays Abolitionist work, moreover, intersected with Black abolitionists famous and obscure, from minister and theologian Alexander Crummel and activist David Ruggles to Albany's uh, Underground Railroad conductor Stephen Myers and Manhattan's uh, Louis Napoleon. Studying the Jay family across time allows us to witness a remarkably and remarkably fraught struggle for a family and a nation to put its most laudable values of justice and equality into action. The Supreme, uh, and I, as I hope we'll address during the coming conversation, the law in general and the Supreme Court in particular play a recurring role in my story. All three featured Jays, as well as the estimable Peter Augustus Jay, were lawyers. That training and knowledge shaped and guided their abolitionist careers. John Jay's years as Chief Justice are some of the most revealing of his life for understanding the contradictions of his approach, approach public and private, to slavery. William Jay played a key role in efforts to free the Africans at the center of the famed Amistad case. And at the end of his life, William Jay recoiled at the Dred Scott decision, leading him to draw stark and compelling contrast between Chief Justices Jay and Taney on the issues of slavery. During the Civil War, John Jay II worried deeply that an aging Chief Justice Taney might seize one last opportunity to subvert the cause of black freedom. In sum, as John J. Chapman insisted in his 1912 meditation on the Coltsville lynch lynching of Zachariah Walker, the long view, the multi-generational view, has much to teach us about the history of enslavement, racism, and the struggles to forge an alternative legacy. And let me stop sharing. Uh, and with that, I very much look forward uh, to the conversation that uh, Professor Jones and I are going to have, and then the, the two of us will have with all of you. So I guess now you and I uh, engage in conversation. You and me. Yes. Um, well, I get I, the first thing um, that I'm I'm struck by um, is um, the your approach, um, which is to think about family and to think about um, generations. Um, one of the questions. Um, that I'm often asked about Abigail is, did she too have family? Um, um, you know, one way I use the term household when referring to the Jays, which is to um, somehow hold together um, both the enslaved people and the enslavers um, uh, among the Jays. Um, but one of the things um, we learn about Abigail, or at least is said about Abigail in the J letters is that um, she's become despondent in Paris because um, she's been away from New York um, and her familiars and her intimates for a long time. 
um, and there's mention of a husband. Um, and uh, this is one of those, um, I think, important, but um, still intriguing um, bits about um, her life, um, that she too had a family and it wasn't merely the household of the Jays. Um, and my sense is your work tells us more about um, what that world was like um, back in New York that she was in a sense wrenched from when she accompanied them um, to Europe. Yeah, because she comes to that. I mean, it, it is very much, you know, at every level, uh, you know, intersecting family stories because she comes into the John Jay household through the William Livingston household, the governor of New Jersey and uh, Sally Jay's father and John Jay's, um, not only his father-in-law, but his comrade in, in, in uh, revolutionary politics. And so she sort of comes into the John Jay household through the Livingston household. Um, and, and there is mention of a husband and a, a sort of uh, Sally Jay kind of callous commentary on, on it about, you know, um, meanwhile, she's really dependent. She, I mean, really dependent on Abigail. Um, I believe Abigail tended to her through uh, a miscarriage and two births while in Europe because they start in Spain and then they move to Paris. Um, and so, I mean, Sally Jay's life in Europe um, was emotionally and materially profoundly affected by the presence of this person who was tending to her, a person who she, you know, had, had known, you know, prior to her marriage. Um, and at least my sense, and I'd be interested to hear what you say, is part of part of her departure um, in Paris is she sort of feels like she's not getting her due in the household. They hire a French servant who who they um, do clearly do not get along. Um, and I, I will not attempt to say um, French names because I'm terrible at it. But um, they they kind of get in a, in a, in a tussle, and um, she decamps to a, a, a washerwoman for wage work. And, you know, I mean, so in addition to wanting her freedom, um, she wants respect. Um, and it's not always clear to me that the Jays can, are willing to or capable of reading between the lines of the very situation that's right in front of them. She has to read their emotional carefully, but they can afford not to read hers. And that's, that's one of the things that's so crushing about the story. Uh, um you also underscore um, something important, I think, in the story of Abigail, which is that for much of um, what we know about her um, through those, this crisis, um, uh, Jay is, uh, John Jay is, is not present uh, much at all. Um, he's corresponding regularly with the household, um, but we watch how um, a slaveholding woman um, I'm going to call her Sarah because I can't okay. can't call her Sally. Okay. But, um, but Sarah J um, is um, with a nephew, um, taking counsel from Benjamin Franklin. Um, but it opens up a window in, in, into the way in which, um, as you know, folks in the later period, um, like the Volia Glimpse and. Um, others will, will write about the 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 important role and the um, and the powerful role that slaveholding women themselves um, play within their households and this example right, of a husband who is for most of the story I tell is in London um, and and merely corresponding getting much of the um, the news about Abigail um, only um, after a delay. Um, we see this role uh, of um, Sarah, Sarah Livingston J, right? If I've got that right, yeah. um, uh, and and how she manages um, both um, workers and enslaved people in the household in his absence. And, and I feel like one of the, and it's not, I don't want to make this sound like blame shifting, but one of the things that's really, really shocking is it's Benjamin Franklin's knowledge uh, and connections um, that. Sort of are what gets her uh, thrown in jail. I mean, he's the one who understand who has connections to specific people and understands um, how to exercise influence. He's the celebrity. Um, but what's also you know, and, and so I think Franklin plays a, just a, a really deeply troubling role in all this. 
but it's also worth noting that it's her very presence in France um, is probably illegal by French law. I mean, like the sort of ways in which France tried to sort of um, uh, quarantine itself from its own um, New World slavery and, and slave owners who want to, would travel back with their enslaved servants. I mean, there's, there's these laws that sort of suggest that they should be confined um, to port until they're ready to go back to the Caribbean. Um, so um, it's not even uh, clear to me that this isn't that the crime um, that there's actually, a, or a, I don't know, I, I'm with lawyers, so I better not use words like crime and misdemeanor as if I, I, I'm qualified to, but a violation of the law, transgression of the law, her, uh, may have existed by her very presence, not in some coastal um, city awaiting return to the uh, Americas, but right there in Paris. Yeah, I, it's such an important point. And I'll mention to folks that um, the very um, illuminating work um, that uh, historian uh, Miranda Spieler is currently doing on um, the presence, the circumstances, and how um, the many, many enslaved people of African descent in Paris, um, how they are, um, how they are regarded um, in this very period. So we will, I think, soon have a, a deeper context. Um, my sense, um, I'm a lawyer, but that doesn't really give me a leg up. I'm thinking about the 18th century much. Um, but my sense is that um, Abigail is detained um, in all likelihood by a, an instrument called a lettre de cachet, which is really um, a, a, an instrument by which um, all sorts of um, dependents who are um, acting up, acting out, acting out of step with the expectations of the head of a household um, can be de detained in Paris during this period. Um, so in this case, the Jays also claim Abigail as property, as an enslaved person, um, but she's detained as a wayward dependent in the way a child might be detained, a wife might be detained, um, a servant, a free servant might be detained. And so um, we never get to um, this thorny question of how and under what, by what terms um, Paris is um, detaining, um, returning, or otherwise um, grappling with the presence of enslaved people in the city. I think this, this avenue that um, is recommended to Sarah J and that she takes um, sort of sidesteps um, the problem of um, whether or not Abigail can be um, treated in, by French law as property. Um, she absolutely can be treated as a dependent um, in this period. And, and one of the things that, uh, you know, the aftermath um, is really fascinating. The immediate aftermath is really fascinating because um, you also see, and one of the things that I, that um, sticks with me at the story is whether and what um, lessons um, the Jays, Sarah and John, and also uh, really importantly, Peter J. Monroe becomes an important abolitionist figure and lawyer in New York in his own right, but as a teenager at the time. Um, what insight do they gain or fail to gain uh, from this, uh, this very harrowing experience? Um, and I'll, I'll give a couple of brief examples. I mean, John Jay writing from London where he's basically off on vacation while um, well, his wife and household tend to these young children. He's written, he's signed the treaty. It's time for him to get some R&R &R and the household goes on, which also tells you a lot about patriarchy. Um, but he, um, he says, I don't understand what she was thinking. I told her I would free her when we return uh, to the United States. We have obviously no way of knowing whether he told her, A, I mean, he says he did, um, and B, whether uh, Abigail believed him, trusted him. Um, but for him, um, rather than, he doesn't ask psychological questions, he puzzles. Uh, and, then, and you see this again and again in, in John Jay's life, where, where oftentimes he's sort of willfully incapable of entering into the emotional space of particularly Black females, um, where he, uh, where he's, and, and other Jays as well, where they're 
confused as to what is motivating people when uh, a little bit of um, uh, empathy they might understand. But he does say this. Um, and the other thing uh, that I find really revealing is um, the servants, white and black in the Jay household, think the house is haunted after in the wake of Abigail's death. Uh, and this is remarked on, I think, in a letter by Peter J. Monroe. Um, and to me, right, this is a this is this is the people at the bottom, the people without power, saying something wrong happened here. But the white Jays can't hear it. They actually, if reported by, by Peter J. Monroe, that they, that they sort of laughed that the servants thought the house was haunted. So they can't hear um, when it's a injustice that's being communicated. Um, to them through this language of haunting. Um, and so what, again, just to sort of finish up with this part of it is, so one of the things I've asked myself uh, in, in, in the rest of the book uh, is to think about like, what lessons did they learn and how did they apply them and what list lessons did they fail to learn and fail to apply and therein hangs uh, a lot of stories. I, I really appreciate um your framing of the lessons um, because I've wondered about that too. Um, you know, Abigail's uh, story um, unfolds um, before um, I think the better known enslaved American young woman, um, Sally Hemings arrives in Paris with Jefferson. Um, and I always wondered in a way that we can't know um, how subsequently enslaved people who came to Paris from the US, um, did they hear, right? did they learn about Abigail's uh, fate? Um, did they learn her story? Um, and what lessons did they um, draw from that? Um, you know, um, uh, Annette Gordon-Reed has, of course, written so um, importantly um, on this, um, and there's no evidence, I don't think, um, as there wouldn't likely be um, if word traveled informally about um, what had befell Abigail. Um, but for me, it helps us understand why, um, in the absence of evidence, um, someone like Sa Sally Hemings um, would not be eager um, to light out onto the streets of Paris um, and to try um, her hand at liberty. Um, that um, That is not an easy and evident um, undertaking at all. Um, it is a profoundly risky one. Um, and that I think is one of the um, lessons um, that might have been taken from Abigail's experience. So, so one thing, and I'm really glad you uh, mentioned that because one thing we do know uh, is, you know, that shortly after this horrible episode, John Jay um, produces a manumission document, writes a manumission document for um, a, an enslaved uh, person named uh, Benoit who was acquired in Martinique on their on the Jay's voyage over to France. And um, before leaving France, John Jay writes a manumission document in which he explicitly refers to slavery as a violation of natural rights, natural law, as a sort of preface, his preamble, if you will, to saying, and um, you know, so in three years hence, once uh, he, he's worked off the, the value of his initial purchase, he will uh, become free. And I mean, this is one of the things that, um, you know, happens again and again, particularly in the John Jay part of the story is um, he's acknowledged actually as early as 1780, really it's early as 1777, he started to acknowledge that slavery is wrong um, and in explicitly enlightenment natural rights language. Um, in 1780, he writes from Europe that uh, New York should follow Pennsylvania's lead and pass a gradual emancipation law and until they do, their prayers for liberty will be impious, right? Uh, so. He has this language. He's helped to draft a treaty that demands the British um, pay for, uh, or tells the British they cannot depart with any uh, black people who, have, uh, who are within their lines. Uh, and that leads to years of diplomatic wrangling. Um, so he, 
it'd be interesting, it'd be hard to get at, but um, right, there's always a negotiation. It's a, always an uneven negotiation, but um, it would be wonderful if we knew more how the manumission document um, that John Jay produced uh, to liberate uh, Benoit, um, how explicit or implicit was that negotiation? Because we know that, uh, that Benoit was one of the people up, who, upstairs in the attic who felt the house was haunted. Um, so how that um, negotiation goes is again, one of those uh, questions that we, would be wonderful to get, but we do know um, that it does produce this document, which is not simply a, I am gonna grant freedom to this person because they're loyal, but I'm gonna grant freedom to this person because it is philosophically necessary. Um, so that might be a lesson learned, but the circumstances and the negotiation are something that we still uh, need to navigate. I, I, I'm glad you underscored um, the negotiation, right? Because one of the things um, we know about Abigail is she does think she's in a position to some degree to negotiate with the Jays and and Peter J. Monroe will be the, um, the intermediary who will sort of carry um, uh, salvos between the Jays and Abigail during her detention. Um, but she does have some sense that, um, and perhaps some history of negotiating um, around her circumstances. And um, that never seems to, um, that never seems to expire. She's negotiating with them um, until, um, the end. Um, I'm very intrigued by this manumission um, document for um, Benoit, the young man um, whom you mentioned. Um, I, I took it in looking at the document, now we're in the weeds, but I, I, I suspect folks on this call are happy to go in the weeds with us. Um, but I took it to be a draft of a, a manumission document. And I wondered a little bit like with Abigail, um, whether um, searching the official record would turn up any confirmation that in fact, um, this manumission document was actually finalized and um, given over to the young man, you know, was it ever, was it an idea that never was seen through or, or um, was it seen through? Um, so, that, so that's a question for you, if you know anything about that. Um, and the other thing you know a lot about, because uh, of course we've, we've all learned this from you in your work is, you know, um, the mistake we sometimes make when we um, uh, uh, encounter, uh, particularly in the 18th century, um, figures um, like Jay who are anti-slavery, we, we equate that with um, abolitionists and radical, the radical abolition um, posture um, that becomes very, very visible by the 1830s and is um, you know, um, popularized and uh, by the um, American um, anti-slavery society. Um, Jay's not a radical abolitionist in this sense, somebody who's looking to affect the immediate and unqualified end of slavery. Um, that's going to come later if I understand sort of the arc of your story. Right. Yeah. But I mean, I, the, the first, people are calling it uh, first wave or first movement. Um, abolitionism, people like Manisha Sinha and Paul Polgar are doing fantastic work on this. Um, I mean, there is no radical movement, you know, until there's a radical movement, but um, it's that the, the first wave of abolitionism is of great consequence. Um, it's very alien to our own sense of how um, change should and does occur, but it does uh, over time uh, produce tremendous change. Um, and another thing that John Jay does is he um, lets himself be kind of drafted into becoming the inaugural president of the New York Manumission Society, which really is one of the first, it's not the first, but one of the first um, organized anti-slavery societies in the, in the Western world. And they're corresponding with all the British and French um, people that abolitionists and abolition historians know. And, um, and, uh, and they explicitly use language of citizenship. They use language of uh, natural rights, but um, they believe uh, self-servingly for certain, but nonetheless, they, you know, they, they have this notion that you can, you can achieve profound change 
gradually um, and that there's a formula you, you can follow. And John Jay, uh, in both his personal uh, conduct uh, and in his political stances, um, he believes in this formula. So, I mean, he even applies it um, to this, this woman, Zilpa, who I've referred to a couple of times, who's buried in the Jay family plot. He applies the logic of gradual emancipation to her, even though the law, because of the date of her birth, doesn't apply. So he apply, you know, he supports the program politically, but he also applies it in his own um, process of gradually um, uh, diminishing and eventually um, um, ceasing to be a slaveholder so that by the 1820 census there are no enslaved people in the Jay household. There will be and continue to be African Americans um, who are, you know, in the case of Clorinda and Zilpa, they're formerly enslaved people, but they're also indentured servants, or it's the labor system, the labor market is particularly in the North is shifting profoundly and they shift with it. Um, so he does come back um, actually delivering in part on some of um, his stated notional principles that we really ought to figure out how to um, wind this practice down. But it there are sort of different spheres in which he's willing to act and spheres where he's willing to not act. So just briefly, right, when it comes to ratification of the Constitution, um, which obviously Jay is, John Jay is closely identified with, um, you know, that's not, a, he was not at Philadelphia, but that's not a price um, he's willing to pay. He's not willing to agitate the issue of slavery or even acknowledge the issue of slavery as a reason not to ratify. So in that sphere, the national political sphere, um, already we see lines that can't be crossed, but at the state sphere uh, in his personal life and interestingly, diplomatically, uh, he moves um, fairly um, dramatically to essentially repudiate the treaty that he himself was uh, an architect of uh, in 1783. By 1794, he's like, we really have no right to not only claim the people, but we are really on shaky ground demanding the British even deliver uh, financial compensation. So what you see as he operates on different principles in different places, but he remains a person who uh, whose comfort um, is provided by enslaved black people who he um, is uh, comfortable acquiring and and uh, and having as essential members of his household uh, until the 18 teens. Yeah, I, I know we're we're probably going to move to questions in a minute. Um, so I, I think. Um, I think one of the hardest things, um, and maybe I, it maybe was too difficult to accomplish um, in my essay about Abigail, it, 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 but it really was to um, ask us to juxtapose the narrative you've just shared, right, about the opportunity, the possibility, um, the gift Jay has um, to evolve, to change, to think better, work differently, um, to juxtapose that against um, Abigail's life and death, um, where those um, possibilities are not only um, not uh, afforded to her. Um, she doesn't even, if you will, live to benefit from the evolution of Jay's own thinking over time. Um, and as historians, um, it is always, our challenge to um, wrestle with where and how we center our work, right? From whose perspective, from which perspective um, do we tell the history of, of this period, um, of this household, um, of the, you know, the, the, the profound questions of the day, like um, the question of slavery, 
um, but I think it was um, a challenge for many of the readers of the piece to, um, if you will, just simply um, sit with how both things can be true, right? And um, it is true, uh, you know, and you've written a wonderful book about Jay and, and his family and changing ideas and more. Um, and it is also true that someone like Abigail's truncated life um, doesn't enjoy the benefits of, of so much of what was to come. Yeah, and, and I want to stress, of course, also that like the people who survive, um, particularly this uh, mother and daughter, it's not like their lives are, um, they're able to enjoy the full fruits of freedom. I mean, Zilpa um, never learns to read. Um, she's only allowed back in the Jay family because um, her she was sort of banished to a Livingston relative uh, when she uh, got pregnant. And then when the child dies, Clorinda, in a move that was so fraught because she's going to Don Jay and, and asks and insists, can we bring her back? I mean, can you imagine, right? Because that's all, uh, and I'm not the only person who's, who's uh, written about Clorinda, but uh, the, imagine that courage it took and on the emotional stress and how fraught it was for her to say to a person over whom she had no, she has no power in that relationship to say, can you please bring my daughter back? And of course, the only reason the daughter can come back is because of this personal tragedy that, the, that her um, infant, or by this point, toddler has passed away. And then Zilpa is back in, in the orbit of him, the family. Um, I mean, the last census she appears on is, um, is 1850, but she's clearly in the Westchester orbit of the Jays. And, and, and um, William Jay's uh, request that she have a plot, place in the plot of the family burial ground is, is honored in 1872. Um, but these are isolated like lives, right? And is, to state the obvious but important thing, um, the 15th Amendment doesn't apply to Zilpa either. She's alive when the 15th Amendment you know, goes into effect, but you know, she's, a, she's a woman. So, I mean, so the isolation and the sort of limits to what freedom um, in the North, even for those who are fortunate enough to live, to um, experience these changes, and they are important. It does matter whether you're an enslaved person or, or you know, receiving wages. Um, it does matter whether you're um, the person who employs you leaves an annuity because these people are not wealthy. The Jays have this sort of long tradition and it's sort of this noblesse oblige sort of paternalistic thing where they leave money for certain uh, chosen people for the duration of their lives. It's, it's makes the Jays feel good. It also speaks to the isolation of even people who are um, well situated and who do live long lives like Caesar Valentine, who um, works in Peter Augustus Jay's home for many years, um, but but isolated, hard to find. Uh, I could never, I could not find Caesar Valentine in the census. I hope there's a historian out there who's better with census records than I or can get into the local archives. But um, we know people are alive, but but tracing their lives um, sort of underscores that sense of isolation. Well, um, I hate to interrupt the uh, conversation because it's fascinating, uh, but we do want to uh, get to some of uh, the questions from the audience. And now, um, just before I get to some of those, I, I, I just was curious, uh, David, you were you know, talking about the family, uh, the Jay family graveyard. Where is that, by the way? So that's at uh, St. Matthew's Church, which is an Episcopal church that the Jays founded uh, in Westchester in the in, uh, Katona, Bedford. I'm never quite sure where the line between Bedford and Katona is, and they one comes out of the other. But it's uh, in you know northern Westchester County, and it and you can visit it and see many of the Jays. John Jay is actually buried in Rye, which is oh. um, a different a different Jay family estate. But many of the other Jays are buried, and and I finally got to see in person. Um, I had a person take a picture of the gravestone for my book but finally um in april i got to uh see it in person and um that was really uh it, as, as martha has suggested right these are powerful things for authors we write about we read about people um but when we we're fortunate enough to encounter um this sort of tangible um their tangible presence it's it's a it's a really powerful thing yes uh 
are, are the living is it the Livingston family there there are New Orleans roots there too. I mean, Bob Livingston, I think, is a descendant of that that line. Some of the Livingstons do go out to Louisiana, but they are as um, deeply entrenched in New York, patroon, no. massive land holding, uh, yeah. shocking amounts of land was owned by a, a handful of uh, these families, the Dutch and then the British um, created these just huge holdings. And so the Livingston family, even, even in the 18th century was a vast and complicated set of uh, family trees, uh, but yeah. Yeah, some of them do make it to Louisiana. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then get, get to the audience. But when did uh, Jay become uh, president of the New York Manumission Society? Was that uh, what, Se- what year? 1785. 1785. Um, yeah. And then he interestingly resigns when he becomes chief justice. That's what that was I, my next question. Which I always found really intriguing because it implies um, that he thinks there could be a case that would pose a conflict of interest. Uh, that's the positive reading. The negative reading is he doesn't stop being uh, an enslaver. So if you know if a case arose, he would still be an enslaver, but he'd no longer be the president of this uh, society. That's, but he pays a political price for it when he runs for governor in 1792. I kid you not. Um, the people running against him basically say this guy's going to take uh, your enslaved people away. He, you know mm-hmm. the, the Dutch slaveholders in the Hudson Valley shouldn't trust this guy because he's this elite New Yorker who's going to take away um, your human property. So even though right, his, his actions are always mixed and troubling, and with one hand, he's doing one thing and one with the other, politically, even at being a moderate abolitionist and a former president of an anti-slavery society is a political liability that he refuses to denounce. He writes the correspondent and says, you know, I'm not taking anyone's property away immediately, but I do believe in the principle of, of, uh, of uh, natural rights. And so, and so be it. And he does lose that election really narrowly, really narrowly. So it could have made a difference. Um, questions from the audience. Um, is there any evidence of the story of Abigail in influencing how the sons uh, perceive um, slavery uh, and, and abolition? Uh, is, is there a line of uh, evidence uh, tracing to Abigail's uh, demise. The best line I can draw, and then I'd be eager to hear what Martha has to say, because she's done, wrote a great article about the New York Manuscript Society and how even their legal work didn't always turn out the way we would want it. But I'll just briefly say that Peter J. Monroe, who was 15, 16, something like that in Paris, go, uh, as this comes along as kind of a, an assistant secretary kind of, um, he becomes a prominent lawyer and a uh, lawyer for the Manumission Society and eventually president of the Manumission Society. Um, how much he remembered this awful moment, uh, I don't know. I think maybe maybe someone can do some more work, but, um, but that's, that's the most direct line I can draw, but I'd be eager to hear what uh, Professor Jones has to say. Yeah, I, I'd also point to Peter J. Monroe as the is the not only the one among the next generation who is um, there and present and knows Abigail intimately and plays a critical role, um, but it's a reminder to me of how I come to be curious, if you will, about Abigail to begin with. And it is because I first encountered Peter J. Monroe um, in New York in later years, um, embroiled in other sorts of contests over um, slavery and freedom. And in my example, um, a group of um, refugees, enslaved refugees from the Haitian Revolution who um, uh, come to the attention of the New York Manumission Society. Um, so uh, certainly, I think, Jim, the answer probably is more work to do to understand and him, him better um, than we understand him today, because I don't mm-hmm. know that anyone has tried to make the connection between these early stories and his later work um, in anti-slavery in New York. Fascinating, Martha, and, and so grateful for your work on this. Um, it's so important. Uh, another question, Kate Masura's recent book on civil rights movements uh, prior to the Civil War also touches on the Jay family. 
uh, how does her work address the work you both are doing? Well, I mean, I think you're gonna be hearing um, because of her work and, and you know, hopefully, uh, you know, because of mine and others, hopefully you'll be hearing a lot more about the days. Um, uh, I have not, I confess, actually read her book, but you know, authors are, are a little bit vain. I did I did look in the index when I saw it to make sure that the J's were in there. Like, oh good, you know, there, there's and uh, <laughs> they're in there. And I and I think, but I think her framing that's, is really that, important. That's, that's, that's called the Washington read. Well, you, you look I, for your your own name first. <laughs> well, I am a native Washingtonian, so maybe I learned it uh, <laughs> learned it at a young age. But um what but I think her framing is really important because uh, you know, something I alluded to. Um, is part and parcel of the latter generation of Jays, particularly William Jay and John Jay II, is they are not only um, radical abolitionists who call for the immediate uh, abolition of slavery and, and, and remain in that movement to the, to, to the very end, but they over time come to see Northern civil rights as an essential aspect of that. Um, and William Jay writes a book called On the Condition of, uh, of, of Colored People where he, this 10 ways in which Northern African Americans are deprived of their rights um, and, and gives strong examples. And John Jay II um, was absolutely a thorn in the side of the Episcopal Church in New York to get equal treatment for Black Episcopalian congregations in New York. He would bring it up over and over again in these elite Episcopalians, bishops, and others. Just, they, they could not understand it. And they, they were very impatient with his impatience with the notion that like the church has to take care of its own house um, where we are um, creating a situation in which this, we're making it easy for the slaveholders and, and the racists nationally. So uh, I think she's absolutely right that um, framing this as a civil rights struggle will open up all kinds of avenues for understanding what's going on in the first half of the 19th century. Um, and if I could just add, and I, I will say, um, Until uh, Justice Be Done is a, a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and um, importantly, um, in a sense, wants to um, bring together, if you will, the descendants of Abigail and the descendants of John Jay um, in an early American story um, about um, struggles um, over race, over rights, over law, over the Constitution um, and the constitutions. And so um, it is an important, I think, um, next chapter. Um, and it underscores, I think, in many ways, how much has changed um, since um, the time of um, Abigail and uh, of John Jay, um, in that there is, in Mazur's telling, this important. Um, political movement um, that is a cross-racial political movement um, for civil rights in the North. I'm going to squeeze one last question in here before I ask you both what you're working on next. Um, and the last one from the audience was, does it appear that the slavery political postures of Jefferson and Jay are similar? I think if you ask the Jay family, they are um, deeply dissimilar and more so over time. And I'll give one very quick example. In the Missouri crisis, the last really important public thing that uh, John Jay does politically is issue a letter that he knows is gonna get published in which he defends, you know, as a former chief justice and an expert on the founding, defends the idea of denying uh, Missouri uh, admission as a slave state. And Jefferson at the same time is, uh, Worrying about the fire bell went up, uh, that goes off in the night and saying that radical sons of the founders are going to ruin this country. So um, there, there's a deep split over time um, mm -hmm. in how they understand the legacy of the founding. Mm -hmm. Martha, do you, do you have any observations on that too? Um, I, I, I don't. I think David has. Uh, um, told us what we need to know so thanks <laughs> well thank you both it, it, let, let's what are you working on next uh, from each of you um well I, i'll jump in to say um uh i'm um at work on a book um titled for now um the jagged color line um and it is a history of 
um, slavery and uh, sexual violence um, and its legacies um, in African American families. Um, it is in one part of history and um, one part um, a family memoir. Um, mm. So um, I very much look forward to a chance to be back with you and talk about that when it's done. So thank we, you. We can't wait for that. That's great. David, how about you? I, I, I'm looking for a new project, but a couple of the ideas I have, I've become um, very interested in the non-prosecution of Jefferson Davis and the other um, elite Confederates. I, I, it's sort of a story of our moment, but I think um, there has obviously been some work on this, but I feel like maybe we need to revisit that story. So that's one of the ideas I have uh, kicking around uh, right now. Great. Well, in the meantime, I'm going to uh, share pictures of both of your books that we have in our book uh, gift shop at the uh, Supreme Court Historical Society, copies of Liberty's Chains by Professor Gilman and Birthright Citizens by Professor Jones are available in our gift shop at uh, www.supremecourtgifts.org. And uh, we're very grateful for your conversation today. I'm so glad we were a, a bit of matchmakers here, uh, getting the two of you together to uh, uh, converse and uh, fascinating for us. I hope uh, enjoyable for you too. And uh, we look forward to more of your work. Our next virtual program uh, is the Society's Constitution Day celebration on September 21st at noon. We're going to have a special screening of the Society's latest documentary. This one is on Marbury versus Madison, and it's going to be held along with a look at the lesson plans that we've designed to accompany it. Uh, registration is available at the Society's website, www.supremecourthistory.org. And uh, I want to uh, close by uh, saying a reminder will be sent to you that a, a survey will go out uh, later this afternoon. And uh, those of you who've joined us in the past will remember this, but uh, everyone who's registered in advance will be sent the survey, and we ask you please respond to it. Uh, we want to make these programs as accessible and valuable to as many people as possible. We thank you all for joining us, and uh, a special thanks to Professor Jones and Professor Gelman today. And uh, with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>